and I am nine years old. Have you seen the moon? What does it look like? Hi, Addison. That's a great question. Of course, on Earth, we've all looked at the moon and it's incredibly beautiful. I highly recommend looking at it with a telescope. Uh, you can see so much more of the lunar surface, um, the geological features. And the coolest place I've seen the moon has been from the International Space Station. We're still very, very close to Earth, so the moon looks uh, about the same that it does on the planet, but it's really neat to see it from space. Jonah, my name is Julia, I'm five years old. I know that there's bumps on the moon, but what I w want to know is through that by seeing you, I've always wanted to know that. Hi, George. I love your question about bumps on the moon. So there are bumps on the moon. It's really incredible. You can see the lunar surface has a lot of craters. Um, these are from meteorites. And the, the lunar surface, believe it or not, a long time ago used to have volcanoes. And so a lot of those are where you see those bumps. The volcanoes, of course, are not active anymore. The lunar surface is not an active geological process. But once upon a time, they were active volcanoes. And so they were blowing steam and also hot magma, like in a volcanic eruption on Earth. I think you might be a future geologist if you're asking these questions. Hi, Abby. Uh, my favorite part of being an astronaut is actually the fact that we get to train to fly in space. I think that's everybody's favorite. Um, the thing that, that maybe you'd be interested in that's, that's a piece of this that's not always apparent um, is the kind of camaraderie that we have uh, when we form our teams for these missions. So we get to work with, uh, it's not just the United States, we get to work with people from countries all over the world. Um, so I've had Japanese crewmates, I've had Russian crewmates, um, I've had crewmates from Europe. Uh, so there's all these different countries um, that come together to form these missions. And then you start training with your crewmates um, up to two and a half years before you, you fly. And then, of course, you spend six months with them on the International Space Station. So it's kind of like picking a college roommate. Uh, you have to make sure the team is functioning really well. Um, but it is just one of the most exciting things about being an astronaut is to watch this team develop um, and to see how well everybody works together when they get a chance to train and practice with each other. Um, so I'm a scientist and I'm an astronaut. Um, we do most of our research on the International Space Station, and that's a great place to learn the effects of gravity on all kinds of systems. So when we're in orbit uh, on the International Space Station, we're essentially in free fall uh, around the Earth, but we have, we're in permanent free fall around the Earth. And so we have what's called microgravity. You may have heard about it as zero G, but there's, there's a tiny amount of gravity there. So we have to call it microgravity to be accurate. Um, and this turns out to be very interesting for a lot of systems. Um, so for example, I'm a biologist. Um, it's fascinating what this does to humans. Um, so we often study humans as a system. Uh, we're also looking at it as it applies to physics, uh, material science, uh, chemistry, fluidics. Um, so one thing that's really neat is we don't have any buoyancy driven convection. Um, so that's on earth. We always have that in all of our experiments on earth. Um, this process of convection. In space, you can look at things like how materials mix together, how fluids form, how collide particles form without this driving force of convection. So it's a little bit of a cleaner way to study all these material science interactions. Um, so there's lots of different uh, really exciting places to go. And I'll send you a website where you can look at some of these uh, experiments that we're doing on the Interna International Space Station right now. So we, we, um, we're, we're, it's all voluntary research, of course, because it's human subjects research, um, but we uh, get presented with proposals and we sign consent forms, um, and then we can actually sign up to participate in the research as research subjects, which is cool. Hi, Astrid. How can you become an astronaut? This is a really good question. 
Um, so a few things about astronauts were often scientists or engineers or pilots. And so you need to have some of that background experience. So when you're in school, if you're interested in studying things like engineering, uh, science, like chemistry, physics, biology, mathematics, or you're interested in flying airplanes, these are all ways uh, that we gain the experience that we need in order to become an astronaut. You also have to go to college. That's really important. Uh, and hopefully you'll study hard for that. Uh, we definitely would love to have you in the astronaut corps. So thanks for the question. And we'll look forward to seeing your application. Kia ora, my name is Tommy. I am nine years old. How many times have you been on the International Space Station? Hi, Tommy. I've been on the International Space Station twice, um, but each of these missions was around six months long. So I've spent a total of 300 days in space. Uh, it's a little crazy to think about that you spent that much of your life in space, um, but it's really an incredible place to be, um, to live and to work. So I'm very glad I've been able to go twice. Hello, my name is Raya and I am seven years old. Will humans ever be able to go for a holiday on the moon? Hi, Ryder. That's a great question. As you know, we're starting to put together a lunar exploration program. Um, and this is a program that involves countries all over the world. Um, so, for example, New Zealand is a signatory to uh, what's called the Artemis Accords. And so as 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 really as an international effort, um, we're starting to build this programs. These programs at first, um, they're very risky. Um, we definitely need to make sure we have um, space agencies that are running these kinds of things. Um, as we progress uh, through these programs, it's possible that we could have lunar tourism and, and somebody could go on a holiday. It might take some time. Uh, we, we've had uh, an international space station in low earth orbit for over 20 years now. And we're just starting to be able to have tourists go to low earth orbit. Um, so I think it will take some time. I think it'll be very expensive initially, but the idea is that we're gonna be able to commercialize this, to make this available to other scientists that wanna study things in outer space or on the lunar surface, um, countries, other governments, uh, and, and maybe even someday uh, private tours that wanna go to the moon. So it's, it's possible, it's gonna take a while. So we do have, for the current commercial astronauts um, that are going to the space station, uh, some of them are going to the space station as a part of a program with NASA. Some are just launching, for example, SpaceX had the Inspiration4 launch um, where they went to space and they're going to have a subsequent series called Polaris. Um, and so for all of those launches, they definitely have to do training. Um, it's, you know, I think it's between like four and six months of intense um, specific training, but but that's spread out over uh, more than a year. Um, so there's a lot of training they have to do for, for safety to make sure that they know um, all the emergencies that could happen on the vehicle, uh, and then just how to work in space to make sure that they can do the experiments um, or the, the public relations outreach that they want to do during their mission. As the facilities change, there may be less of a commitment. If, the, you know, if there really are things like space hotels, then you're not going to have to do a four month training in order to stay at the hotel. But that because it's a dangerous environment, um, there definitely will be always some kind of training involved. First feeling uh, when floating in space was, this is absolutely incredible. Um, it takes a while for your brain to even get used to it. So when you launch to space, it's incredibly quick. It takes nine minutes to get to low Earth or orbit, which is 400 kilometers um, above the surface of the Earth. And when the rocket engines cut off, then all of a sudden you're floating. Um, I couldn't really even process that because my brain was spinning so much. Um, so the very first feeling is like you've just been kicked down the stairs. Once your brain settles and figures this out, um, then you can do things like watch your notepad float up into the air or watch a pen float around. So you'll see if you see videos of the astronauts in their capsule, 
sometimes they're they're just batting things around because it's so interesting to watch it. The place where you really feel like you're floating in space is when you float into the International Space Station because that's a much bigger uh, volume. And so that's an amazing feeling. Um, you have to learn how to fly, actually. So we, we float in space, but if you want to get from place to place, you actually have to push off something. Um, so we often use our feet. We push off the wall of the space station, and then you have to figure out how to control yourself like you're an airplane. Um, so floating is great. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Uh, floating with the direction that you want to go to and not ramming your head into something else is a whole other ball of wax, but we do get pretty good at that after a while. Train for spacewalks in the neutral buoyancy laboratory, which is this big pool. And so we can weigh people out so that they are neutrally buoyant. And so we learn how to react forces there, but you're held very stable by the water. It's, it's underwater. Um, and so you don't really get that feeling of every tiny motion that you put uh, into yourself is going to perpetuate forever. It's Space is a great place to really confirm that all of Newton's laws are in fact uh, valid. <laughs> and so that, that experience is just um, one that you have to learn on board because we can't replicate it very well here on Earth. So I didn't think uh, that it was gonna be that important to have things with me from Earth. We can't take a lot when we fly into space because um, we're going in this very small capsule, but we are allowed just a few kilograms where we can pack things that we want. Um, and so I brought, uh, we can't bring our iPhone, which is tragic, um, but I, so all my photos are on this, um, but I did bring, I printed out and I brought a few photos of my family, my friends, my dogs, um, and, and I got some letters that people wrote to me. While I was in space, I got cards, um, and those things turned out to be really important. It's it's this feeling um, of you know you're you're getting something from home. So if you've ever been to summer camp or been away from your family for a long time, and somebody's written you a card or or sent you a photo, there's that great sense of connection to people you care about um, back on Earth. So I didn't think it was going to be that important. And it was one of the things that I thought was the most special. Um, I hung them up in my crew quarters so I could see them every day and uh, put a smile on my face before I went to work every morning. Kira, my name is Vera and I am at Tuluta Atago Museum. Kira, my name is Jara and my question for you today is um, uh, what do you eat in space and does it taste different than on Earth? My question is, is the food, what is the most delicious food you've ever bring to space? Bye! Bye! Hi, Jara and Vera. These are great questions. Astronauts actually talk a lot about food in space. It becomes very important to us. Um, so we we enjoy some of the space food. Um, we usually have it together around a table as a crew. Um, and so we have things that, that you would have on Earth, for example, um, vegetables and meat and oatmeal in the morning. Um, pretty much everything that you can think of on Earth we're usually able to bring up to space, but we have to bring it in a very different form. We have to dehydrate it. Um, the, the mass of the water, that weight of the water um, is a lot of your food and it's very expensive to launch things from earth. So we dehydrate everything and then we use water on board the space station to rehydrate it again. Um, so you get a little pack of dried vegetables or a pack of dried meat um, and then you, you put water in it and all of a sudden it turns into a normal vegetable or normal meat. Um, the reason that we can do this and we don't have to fly up a lot of extra water is that we actually recycle all of our water on the space station. Um, so our, our space station uh, has this uh, closed loop where all of the water, all of the moisture in the room gets collected and it gets purified um, and we don't have to ship up extra water. So it's this idea of recycling that really allows us to eat food in space. And it's mostly like what you have on earth um, and it tastes mostly like what you have on earth. Uh, it's just packaged and sent in a different way. And Vera, for what's your question about what is the most delicious food that I have ever brought to space um, and eaten in space. 
Um, and this is a really good question. Um, I d- the, the food that I brought was pretty good. And I, I picked all the things that I really like to eat on earth. Um, but I flew with a Japanese crewmate and he brought mochi balls to space. And I don't know if you've ever had mochi, but it was some of the most delicious things I've ever had for dessert. He had a whole bunch of different flavors um, and he's a nice crewmate. So he shared with everybody on the crew uh, and for a little while was the most popular guy in space because he shared his mochi with us. I would uh, just like to say I'm so excited uh, about the science festival. I think it's absolutely incredible that it's open to the public, um, that you all get to come in and experience this. Uh, I hope that you're able to learn something new, that you get some super interesting idea uh, or an area that you haven't thought about before. Uh, And whether you're uh, nine months or 90 years old, I hope that you can take something away from this. just, you know, how much fun it is to be a scientist, how delightful this is as a job. Uh, And and if this is not your job, just that it's great to do as a hobby. Um, You know, if you look at your kids, they are probably all scientists. Every two-year-old is a scientist. They want to pick things up uh, when they're walking around. They want to make observations. Um, And so things like reading articles uh, about science in the newspaper, um, reading journal articles or, or popular sites that, that talk about science uh, and make that available to the public. This, to me, is, is so much fun. Um, I think it's, it's not just something that we do in school. We can incorporate that into our daily lives. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share that and to participate a little bit with you.